Um, for some reason, Matt wanted me to tell my story. I'm not sure what he was thinking. Um, usually when people tell their stories here, it ends with a, you know, a really cool, like, but God moment. I'm still looking for mine. About two years ago, I actually told my story here. It was almost two years ago to the day. And uh, it was a very happy-go-lucky story. Not really, but it's okay. And so I'm going to, he said, you know, why don't you just tell where you are and what's been happening in the last two years? And I said, okay, sucker, here we go. At first, I was going to talk about how my story relates to Endgame. No spoilers, don't worry. So in that movie, there's so many themes of redemption and confession and mental health. I'm like, oh, there's so many things I can pull together. But then, spoilers. So I didn't do that. So this is where we're going to start. We're going to start by going way back to some classic tales of yore, a.k.a. The Matrix and Star Wars. And, and this is why. There's a reason for this. There was a man named Joseph Campbell, and he wrote this thing, um, this, this idea, this um, monomyth about the hero's journey. And in that, he described the hero's journey in three sections. There's actually a bunch of different stages within those sections, but we're going to talk about the three main sections. And so if you've watched Star Wars and The Matrix, and I'm sure you've had, you probably have seen a lot of similar themes in both movies. So this is where it's at. He talks about the three main stages as departure, initiation, and return. Okay, so departure. So you leave your present context moving into a new adventure, moving into the unknown. That's fair, right? That seems pretty normal, right? So that's like uh, Luke Skywalker you know, and Obi-Wan, they meet Han Solo, they go on the adventure to, to save Princess Leia, right? Boom. Uh, Neo chooses the correct pill, Right, gets unplugged from the Matrix, goes on his adventure. Make sense so far? All right. The next stage is initiation. So now this is where the heroes on this journey, they realize that this is not an easy one. There's actually a lot of danger. There's a lot of unknowns. It's, it's not safe. It's, there's tensions. There's trials. There's tribulations. There's drama. All right? Still with me? The last one is the return. So now the hero comes back, he's a champion, but he's not the same person as when he left. He's totally, dramatically changed. He's grown, he's matured, um, she's stronger, she's bigger, she's Captain Marvel now. She's moved to a whole different phase of their life. So in this case, now Luke's a Jedi and the leader in the rebellion, and Neo is like Superman and flies off to the screen. That's essentially the hero's journey in those three movies. Stage one represents a comfort zone idea. It's safe here. It's known to us. But stage two and three are totally different because they represent the unknown, the embracing of the unknown, letting go of safety. And we cling to the known because it's easy. In my faith for better or for worse, has gone through a similar journey. I'm kind of stuck in stage two. Yay for me. Let me move back a little bit. Um, growing up, I grew up in the church. I was a church kid, pastor's kid. Church pastor's wife, kid. Because that's a whole other context. And I had some great leaders, and I had some really, really awful ones, some really terrible ones. And I was a kid, like my son, always asking a million questions and always hungry for knowledge. Uh, if you guys are in the Enneagram, if you know that whole thing, I'm a four-wing five, so I love learning all the things about all the things. That's what I love. So I would try and ask all these amazing questions. Well, I thought they were amazing as like an eight-year-old or 10-year-old or 12-year-old. Um, and the problem was my questions about faith were always seen as questions against faith. You can't talk about the Bible. Don't worry about it. It's all true. Okay, fair enough. And as I grew older, I realized 
it was so good to be part of this amazing system. It promised answers. It promised solutions to life. That's what I wanted. That's what my community around me wanted. Um, and I was desperate for that system to work for me as I saw it working for others. Uh, but it didn't. The system didn't work. Uh, the promises just felt empty. Um, and the answers just felt like a lie. And after years of drama and purity culture and spiritual abuse and burnout on top of burnout and um, whatever kept me tethered to this thing just broke. And I wasn't able to put words around what was happening. I didn't have the language. Um, they weren't the cool podcasts out yet, the cool books. So I didn't have that sense of being known or that sense of like, oh yeah, this is a normal thing actually. And it's okay to go through this. One of my, uh, one of my heroes, actually one of the first books I read when I was going through this was um, um, Searching for Sunday by an amazing woman named uh, Rachel Held Evans who passed away yesterday morning. Um, I want to read this quote. Um, it's that really big thing of text. It's really huge. It's massive. But I want to put it all on one screen intentionally. There are recovery programs for people grieving the loss of a parent, sibling, or spouse. You can buy books on how to cope with the death of a beloved pet or work through the anguish of a miscarriage. We speak openly with one another about the bereavement that can accompany a layoff or a move, a diagnosis, or a dream deferred. But no one really teaches you how to grieve the loss of your faith or how the loss of your faith as it once was. You're on your own for that. Yes. That's what it felt like for many years. So when I finally came to grips with this whole thing and uh, made some changes in my life, <laughs> some, some of them unintentionally, some of them intentionally, um, we started checking out different churches because my thought was like, I need to stay grounded in some kind of faith. And so we did the the best thing you could possibly do. We went to a mega church with big lights and big sound with that screaming teaching. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about, the screaming teaching. And I was really hoping that maybe one of the really cool top 40 worship songs would kind of, you know, stir up the Jesus in me. Hmm. Really what I wanted was anonymity. I just wanted to sort of hide in the background. I've been in leadership for over 20 years. I just didn't want to do anything. I was like, I just want to sit in the back. Just sit in the shadows and just kind of be. But what I was, what I thought I needed was anonymity. What I really wanted was, I don't know, some groups of affinity, actually. I wanted people that I can connect to, to relate with, who can understand this broken faith nonsense. How do you remain a follow Christ when you are barely hanging on? And one thing I knew for sure, that if without community, left to my own devices, I'm, I'm done. I'm finished. I didn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I just want to get a new bathtub or burn the house down and build a new house. I say this to a lot of my friends, and they always give me these really strange looks as they gasp with horror. But essentially, I spent many years trying to kill God. The God that I created. The God that was given to me by bad leaderships. In hopes to find the real one, the one I hear about, the one I read about, the one I sing about. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm searching for. That's what I'm longing for. So now, where does community come in? Oh, here we go. Get ready. In our context, in the spiritual community, we have this language, the culture of the table. Actually, we have that, that amazing table icon. Oh, look at that. I actually love these things. I mean, that was actually one of the selling points. I was like, this, this is cool. It just looks cool. No, I'm kidding. 
And for me, I, I take the whole table thing quite literally. Eating and drinking together for me is my love language. If we can sit down some good steaks and some tasty beverages, wink, then for me, all of a sudden, magic happens. All of a sudden, things change. Um, those spaces and places have become my sanctuary, literally. It's where I find the divine and where I feel safe. And that's all fine and good, but what happens when you're sitting around the table and it's not stories of yay God or even yay life. It's stories of like, this is crap. Everything sucks. There's nothing good on this earth. What happens then? How much fun is a table experience then for you? So here we answer lament. A while ago, I, I tweeted, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tweeter uh, on, the, on the Twitter. I love that site. It's fun. It's a good time. Um, I, I tweeted something really dumb, and cause I was, I, angry Twitter bugs me. And so I was like, people, if you work in the spaces of like justice and change, and you lack the gift of empathy and listening, change your Twitter bio. Because what I saw were people not listing people's stories. They're just saying, no, you're wrong. Your story's wrong. I don't care what you've gone through. It's not as bad as what I went through. I'm like, okay. Let's... Having conversations about trauma is now competition instead of a place of compassion. And that happens. Sometimes that's life. But I don't think it's right. And I wrote this down. I want to make sure I read this correctly. As we talk, as we grow together as a community, as we continue doing what we do around the table, um, as we grow more organically and intentionally um, within our relationships, like we have settlers from varying degrees of privilege, First Nations, first and second generation refugees, and people of color, in one way or another, and in ways not equal to each other, we've all been affected. We've all been traumatized one way or another. We've all gone through our crap. The goal isn't to use that as leverage on t like against each other. The goal is to learn or unlearn, to reimagine and to lament together. And if we can't lament together, patriarchy, racism, trauma, the usual socio-political discord we, we see and feel around us all the time, and then it becomes really harder for us to hold each other's personal laments. So if we can't gather together and say, these are the things that are wrong with us, our cities, our country, our world, that when someone's going through the stuff, it's harder for them to be open and honest. We need to exercise publicly so we can enjoy those times privately around the table. Does that make sense? Okay. People, listen up. Part of being the people of the table, the culture of the table, means sitting with someone whose faith journey might frighten you, whose pain and grief just needs to be recognized and validated. And we, the community, we want to stand along the least and the last and the lost, which for me, I'm, I'm all about. I'm so excited that we are a church that wants to do that, because most churches don't. I just said it out loud, sorry. But we do. I'm so thankful for that. But sometimes that's a lot easier than standing aside the broken and the other and the enemy. Jesus calls us to do both. Both. We need to help people outside of these walls who need the most, but also inside our walls who need the most too. So being people at the table isn't just about celebrating together, though we do and though we should. It's also about grieving and lamenting together, or even scarier, like crossing the road of difference, which is tough. 
in creating brave spaces so we can enter into someone's story and be real and be honest. Especially with those stories who you might not understand or agree with or even like. But creating and holding those spaces are key. So, I call this divine doubt. I believe my doubt is, uh, will eventually lead me closer to the one I'm searching for. And do- doubt has taught me many things. I'm thankful for the season of the shadow. It's taught me how to be present in one struggle, um, to move uh, past just holding safe spaces and holding brave spaces, to learn and to grow. Doubt has taught me that being people at the table isn't just about celebration, but also lament. Doubt has taught me that it's okay to doubt and to question. Doubt has taught me um, that faith is a mystery and not certainty. Again, this amazing woman, uh, Rachel Held Evans, um, in her last blog, she ended with, death is a part of life. And I'm totally okay that my safe space, my comfort, uh, that stage one of the hero's journey is dead. I'm so happy to let go of certainty. Not that's easy, but I'm happy. I fully embrace the mystery. I'm humbled by it. I'm in awe of it and the wonder of divine love. I'm learning more about embodiment, rest. Imagine that, rest? That's a new thing for me. Um, Diving deeper into justice work. Enjoying community much more. Learning about the sacred interaction between my intuition and the divine. Freedom from shame. No, not not quite, actually, I'm still living in shame, but that's okay for now. Learning how best to love my neighbor, to love the other. I think my doubt will bring about my resurrection. Fully becoming who I'm made to be through the path and the power of doubt. I'm going to stop there. We're going to be reenacting a thousands-year-old ceremony again this morning, as we've done uh, most weeks. It started when, when God's people were in Egypt as slaves, and God asked his leader Moses to lead them from slavery, demanding the Pharaoh to free them. And there were a number of things that showed God's power to the Egyptians. There were frogs, there were boils, locusts, water turned to blood. Which ones am I missing? Charlton Heston styles. There were hail. hail, yes, hail. And the last one is the firstborn sons were going to die. But God said to his people, he gave them specific instructions. He said, if you kill this lamb and spread its blood above your doors, you'll be spared. You'll be passed over that your sons won't die. And there were specific instructions. They were supposed to eat a special meal with their coat on, with their sandals on, with their walking stick, like ready to go, because God was going to free them. And so fast forward to Jesus. He was celebrating the same festival with his disciples in the days before he died. He was gathering with the lamb, with the bread that wasn't even left to rise, with, you know, have your coat on, be ready to go, tell the story of what God did. And he was instituting this as a new Passover, a new kingdom, saying, this bread that you've been eating with your families and your families and your families before you is my body. This blood that you're drinking, this wine that you're drinking (laughs) is my blood. This is a new covenant, a new kingdom. And this was supposed to be a family meal. So Jesus and his best friends were gathering around the family table to have this special meal they'd been having with their families for generations. And... Jesus told them, whenever you gather, whenever you get together with with our people, with our family, you should be doing this, the same celebratory meal and remembering. And Drew was talking about, you know, the sanctuary space of, of eating and drinking together. So even though this 
you know, we're taking bread or a cracker and dipping it in juice, which is not how I usually eat my bread or my crackers. It's a weird ceremonial thing. We stand in a line, we come to the front, we dunk the thing. This is our shared meal. This is joining with thousands of years of God's people of saying, we remember the Passover. We're eating this meal together. We're gathering around this table together. And Jesus' disciples, they had all of their trauma, their griefs, their doubts, their, I mean, the disciples were so close to Jesus and yet betrayed him and doubted him in so many ways. And we bring those same fears and traumas and doubts in our weird ceremony of dipping our bread in our juice. And so today is part of what we're doing, no matter how, who you are, no matter who the person standing next to you is, or no matter who the person holding the weird plate of bread is to you, this is our family meal. This is our way of gathering together, um, eating this together and saying, God, we join in this covenant with you. We join in centuries of you delivering your people. We bring all of who we are, good or bad or whatever it is, around this table and we eat this and we do this together. So I'm going to get the band to come back up. We're going to sing some songs and some folks are helping to serve our weird ceremonial meal. And we're going to do this together. We can take and eat this meal around a table, whatever it means to you. If it's a meal of celebration, if it's a meal of acknowledging doubts, wherever you're at, God invites you to this table with these people. Let's do this together this morning. <laughs>